I was walking point in Cambodia. I was the first one. I had 100 guys behind me. And I came a, across a trail. It was a two-track. There was a Jeep going through it, and it was yeah. freshly used. <clears throat> and uh, I had him radio back to the captain and tell him it was a two-track. And he said, uh, all right, we need 100 guys to go past, but we need cover. He said, Larry, you go to the right of the trail and send Mike to the left. So probably about 20 seconds later, Mike's going to cover the left of the trail, yeah. and two Vietnamese jumped out behind a tree and they shot him and dropped him, and he went back to the United States. He's still alive, but, and I was on the right side, and I'm thinking if the captain told me to go to the left, that would have been me that got shot instead of him. But I was covering the right side, and they medevaced Mike out, and then we went past the trail, but he was mm -hmm. just a good guy. Yeah. And. Well, you mentioned that, you know, Mike got hit instead of you, and it could have gone the other way, and you know a lot of guys who who were wounded, or you, you yourself were wounded. Um, and, uh, of course, there are guys, you know, who, who, didn't, who didn't make it. Have you ever, in your mind, sort of gone through that? You know, why did I, why did I get to come home and, and they didn't? I thought about one guy. His name was Dennis L. Daves. Mm -hmm. And um, he's on the wall with Bill Williams as being dead. But Dennis L. Daves, he, you, if you have an ammo box that you keep your M60 ammunition in, 7.62 millimeters, yeah. uh, it's got a rubber seal around the top. But after we go through the M60 ammunition, you got an empty can with a rubber seal. And in the monsoon season, it rains for six months. So we put our letters inside the steel box. Mm. Well, Mike had a little tape recorder and a little cassette. And his parents were solid Christians, and so was Dennis. And he was the only one in the whole company that I knew of that would play the pastor's messages from the week before or two weeks before. And he, so his parents would send him the recordings of the recordings. sermons. And yeah. he had a tape recorder in his box. Yeah. And he was a, a solid Christian, didn't smoke, didn't swear, didn't smoke dope. I mean, he was mm. like, if there's anybody that I looked up to as being a man of integrity, it was Dennis L. Daves. And, but he didn't make it. And he didn't make it. We, the, the captain said, uh, we're going to set up two automatic ambushes, and I want them both to go out there about 300 yards each. And one guy went 200 yards. So after Dennis set his up 300 yards, he was coming back to our, our camp, and he walked into the other oh one. Oh, my gosh. So another friendly, friendly another Another friendly death. Friendly and it just blew him away. Mm. And it was just like, I'm thinking, I got my beads, right? You know, I told you about the... The rosary beads, I'm, yeah. I'm praying my beads, yeah. but I'm smoking dope, and I'm getting high, and, and uh, whatever else... But this guy's living it. He was a real deal. He's a Christian. And then all of a sudden, fear started getting on me. Like, it, it was kind of like jumping on me, there, some fear, because this guy, if anybody's going to make it through Vietnam, it's going to be a guy that's walking with God like he is. And that kind of freaked me out because he's dead. And here I'm not, you know, I, I'm praying my beads, but is, is that going to get me through, you know, it just, it scares mm. you. What's going on with the, the picture below? Uh, the below is, is where we're getting picked up. We'd already been walking through the jungle and you gotta pop the smoke so that they can see where you're at. And they're yeah. just bringing the birds. There's one, two, three, probably seven of them just gonna pick us up. Yeah. We jump in and take off. And I remember, you know, if I look at that, I'll tell you what I'm remembering. Yeah. Uh, I had ingrown toenails real bad, and I kept complaining, I want to get these things taken out, yeah. these ingrown toenails. And uh, they just wouldn't let me go to the rear, you know. It, it's like, you want to get to the rear, and, and uh, you're not going to get shot at in the rear. They're yeah. just going to take care of your toenails. Mm -hmm. So this guy that was a medic, you could have been a medic, you know, he wasn't a doctor. But he said, oh, I, I can take out your ingrown toenails. So he takes this needle about this long, 
and he pushes it into my toe. And it's just like, oh, you know? And then, then he says, uh, well, I got some, some scissors here. He cuts, cuts about a third of my toenail out right down the side and yanks it out. And I mean, I'm in so much pain, it's unbelievable. And I'm saying, uh, forget the other one. You know, I, I'll deal with the ingrown toenail. This is just killing me. You know, and I'm re really in pain. And while I'm laying on the table like this, I looked over. I just looked over, and there's a helicopter coming, just like those that we just saw. Yeah. And he comes on the pad where the, where the first aid station is. Yeah. And they bring a guy in on a stretcher. And I looked over at him, and he had an M16 stuck right through him. Stuck right through him. The butt plate was here. And the barrel was here, and it was stuck right through him. And I'm, I'm, I'm hurting with my toe, but I forget about my toe. Yeah. And I looked at this guy, and he was a white guy, but he looked like he was black. And I said, what happened to him? And they said he was on a reconnaissance team, and it was five men. And they made contact with the enemy. So they got a, a helicopter hovering over the top of the trees. They can't land it because it's too many trees. And they got a, a chair that comes down about 200 feet. It's a jungle penetrator. That's what I heard. And this, these guys were on it. Well, four of them got up to the top in the bird. And the two guys on the side got their M60 machine guns from the Huey, and they're keeping the enemy away. So the last guy gets up in the chair, and he gets up there about 100 and some feet, and the chair slipped, and he flipped right out. And he landed on his rifle. Oh, my gosh. And it stuck right through him. Was he still alive? Oh, okay. He was out there dead for five days, and they went back to get him. So I'm in the first aid station, yeah. got one of my toenails done. I'm looking it over at him. He's got a rifle stuck through him. He's been dead for five days. Guess what? That other toe didn't hurt too bad after that. And I said, all right, do my other one. Good, so I stuck the needles in there and pulled a third of that out and then just wrapped them up. They were bleeding like crazy, and when they stopped bleeding, they sent me back out to the jungle. But when you look at something like those pictures, yeah, that's good. it brings back the memories of that guy, yeah. that guy coming in with a helicopter and a rifle mm -hmm. sticking through him. Jeez. That's what I think of. On my R&R &R when I was in Vietnam in 1970, my mom and dad came up, came to Hawaii. I took my R&R &R in Hawaii. They gave me 10 days. And so my mom and dad came. I played golf every day. I wanted to play golf. So I played 36 holes of golf every day. Mm. But I was playing golf. But even today, after all these years, if I hear a loud noise, I'm still jumping. So it's still with you too. It's, it's just... inside of my, I don't know, my feet or something. I don't know. But, but yeah, just, it, it's, yeah. I don't like firecrackers. I don't like yeah. the 4th of July. I don't like loud noises. And, um, but I was, I was in the 14th story of the Ilikai Motel in Hawaii. My dad and mom had a room. I had my room. And my dad was just looking out the window, 14 stories up. Mm. And I was between two beds. And it had a backfire. And this is right at, I mean, I'd been in, in the jungle just slightly before that. So you heard a backfire out in the street. Out in the street. Yeah, 14 floors down. Bam, I'm down. <laughs> Underneath the bed, and I'm just shaking like this. And my dad looked at me, mm. and he started crying. Mm. He couldn't believe that I was that. How, how could I hit the ground that fast and just be shaken because I'm, I'm getting mortared or getting shelled? I got hit once being shelled, but, you know, it just mm. a couple stitches and nothing. Was he a World War II vet himself? Yeah. He was, Had he, he seen combat himself? No, he no. well, he was a, a bomber. He was a captain okay. in the Marine Air Corps. He was a bomber pilot. Okay. So, you know, he, he probably took some bullets, but yeah. he didn't see Not that up front. Yeah. So, so that was where I was at. When I came back from Vietnam, I kind of had a breakdown in, in my living room floor, and I was just crying and pounding the floor or something, and my dad was sleeping. It was 2 o'clock in the morning. Of course, mm. I'm drinking, right? Mm. I'm, I'm drinking and yeah. partying, and, 
And he says, he says, I don't care what it costs to get you fixed, but you know, I'm, I want to help you. So he sent me to his, his doctor, Dr. Souza. And he said, he needs to go to a, a psychiatrist because I had dreams. I, I kept having dreams. I was running out of bullets. Mm. And, and, I'm, and I, I don't have any bullets in this dream. And so all of a sudden I would just jump in my machine. There's nothing there. It's just a, a, a vacant, empty floor. Jumped on my machine and there's nothing there. Mm. And I press my button and I'd start flying. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I'm laughing at the gooks because they can't get me. I guess you guys can't get me. I'm flying now. And they all jumped in their machine and they started flying after me. And then it just got so intense mm. that I just turned off my machine and I'd just go, and I'd hit the Song Bay River because we always used to take assaults over the Com Song Bay River into yeah. Cambodia and, and Vietnam. But I remember always flying over that. And I'd hit the ground. I'd wake up in a cold sweat. So I'm telling the, the shrink that. And so they put me on this medication to calm me down. And the first one, the second one. And, and uh, then after seeing this guy twice, he said, he said, you're your situation is just, I can't handle it. You know, I need to send you to a World War II veteran. So he sent me to this German guy. His name was Dr. Gonknar. And uh, so I spent two times with him, but it was like, since I was wounded twice, they wanted to give me disability checks. And I couldn't stand the government because they said they were pulling out so many thousand troops, like a hundred and so many thousand troops. When I got over there, and so I asked the Air Force guys, I said, are they sending guys uh, back with full planes and sending the planes back empty? I said, Nixon just said he's pulling out so many thousands of troops. Well, he pulled out Big Red One, the 82nd Airborne, but the only ones he pulled out were the guys that had 30 days or less. So all the rest of them were going back to Vietnam. I mean, they're going to fight. And so then I talked to the Air Force and they said, they're sending the planes over full and they're going home empty. And I'm thinking, man, the government lied to me. They said they were mm. pulling all these guys out. So I'm, I'm angry at the government the whole time I'm fighting the Vietnamese. And they sent me these papers for disability because I was wounded twice. Yeah. And I remember just taking the papers and chewing them up. My mom's there looking at me like I'm crazy. What's this kid doing, eating an envelope? And if it said government on it, I just chewed it up. So I, and I just chewed it up and I just, that's what I think about the disability papers. So I just chewed them up and spit them out. And so. Now you I'm, realize that does sound kind of crazy, right? It does. <laughs> yeah. you know, so I went by myself. I knew one guy and every yeah. single person starting from 12 months, this one's got 11, this one's got mm -hmm. eight, this one's got six, this yeah. one's got four, and they all are mishmashed. And it, we need bodies. Just throw bodies in there. And, 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 and fundamentally for each one, although you get into situations where you might, you know, you might help each other out in a jam, but for each person individually, it's all about checking off those days. And when my days come, I'm out of here. Yep. It sounds like it was a pretty dog eat dog situation. Yeah, like, like the guy that was shooting up with heroin, he says this to me. He said, Larry, you may be a blankety blank, 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 because everybody was cussing. Yeah. But if we get in the foxhole, I want you in it with me. Well, we're in Cambodia, and the captain says, watch it. We got movement. And at that time, we didn't have uh, four platoons. We only had three. We had like about maybe 80 guys. We were way down on our strength. You know, we had Bill got hit. So we, we didn't have many people. And we got our circle, and we're right there. And I'm on observation post. I'm out there, and I'm sitting on my steel pot, and I'm just looking. They said, keep your eye out there. There's movement. And so I'm looking, looking, looking. Well. I only had to be out there an hour, and then Joe Dorio, he, he came to relieve me, the guy that said he'd want me in his bunker with him. Well, he was a sniper. He had an M14, semi-automatic. And he said, Larry, let me borrow your 16. I said, what? You know, what? you know. He said, no, I need it on automatic in case I, somebody's there. I, I don't want my M14. Mm -hmm. So I left my steel pot there. 
Your helmet. My helmet. Yeah. And Joe's on observation post. They usually put one north, south, east, west. So we're looking. And I'm in the back. I don't have a rifle. And I've never been an assistant machine gunner. I've never fed the machine gun. And I'm and I was walking point that day. I'm the point man, the first one to take the bullet. Well, Joe's out there, and he's out there about 15 minutes, and he opens up. And he comes in in shock. He says, I hit one. I ripped him right up the face. And he's just kind of freaking out. Mm. And, and I said, Joe, give me my rifle. He said, no, get mine. I don't have a rifle. He wouldn't give me my rifle back. This is Mr. Joe, right? Mm. Mm. So they're, they're opening up on us. They're shooting mortar rounds up. It's in the jungle, and they're hitting at the top of the trees, throwing shrap metal down. And there's three guys, A, B, and C, and then me. I don't have a rifle. And the machine gunner's right there. So I'm feeding the machine gun. I'm just feeding him. Joe took off with my rifle. What am I going to do, throw stones at him? So I'm feeding the machine gun. The machine gunner, brrr, and there's just walls of bullets coming. We got RPGs, rocket propelled grenades. They're going right over our heads. So I'm, I'm there with, with, with no, no rifle. And we're just, it's a wall of bullet coming at him. We're down. Then we'd fire a wall of bullets. And they said, Larry, throw the grenades. So there was like six or seven grenades. And they all throw me their grenades. They're in a pile. Well, anybody want to put their head up? You put your head up, it's going to get shot off. So it's just like, I said, all right, I'm going to take the grenades. When I'm ready to throw it, open up. So I'd pop the pin, take off the safety. I got the grenade in my hand. They'd open up, and I'd whew, whip out one. Then I'd get down, they'd fire back. Took out a second one. Third, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh. Threw all the grenades out there. And we got a wall of bullets coming at us. Bill Williams, he took a bullet in the ankle right next to me. You know how many bones are in your ankle? He's screaming. The medic comes, bandages up his ankle. They're just firing at us. We're, we're firing just a wall of bullets. And somebody said, look up, look up. Somebody look up. Who's going to look up? Nobody's looking up. But I looked up. And you know what I looked up? I saw two Viet Cong right 30 feet away. And he's got a chai com in his hand. And he goes like this. Chinese grenade. Chinese grenade. Yeah. And he goes, whoosh. And I see it till this day in slow motion. It's just going like this. Mm. End over end. And it's coming right where I was feeding the machine gun. And I yell, grenade. So, so anyways, the grenades are there. They're gone. They just throw a chai com. It blows a hole that deep in the ground and that wide and took that 65 pounds of steel or whatever that machine gun is and just broke it in half like a tinker toy. Wow. So that's gone. When, that, when I saw that grenade coming and I yelled, grenade, grenade, I ran around a mound of dirt. It was about that high. And I got behind it like that and it blew. So these other three guys, one guy's already shot in the ankle, they get, they get shrap metal all over them. The guy that was doing the machine gunner, and it blew the 60 up, he gets shrap metal in him. I don't have a rifle. Joe's got my rifle. Those guys all left their rifles there because it blew up our position. All the M60 machine gun ammunition's there. And I, after that blew, I ran behind a tree about 20 feet, and I see the two gooks right there. They blew up our position, blew up our machine gun, and these guys are crawling away backwards. And the Viet Cong takes another Chai Com threw it over their heads, about three feet in front of them, they're crawling into the grenade. Then they see the chai com, and they go back like this, and it blows them up that more. So now mm. they, they, they got blown up that way, now they got blown up this way, the medic comes. I said, give me your rifle. There's two gooks right behind that tree. And he goes, I need my weapon to protect myself. I said, give me that thing. Just grabbed it, put it on rock and roll. There's two gooks there, 18 bullets just holding it right on him. And he said, what are you doing? Wasting ammo. We're surrounded. You know, and it was just like, there's two gooks right there. So the medic takes his, takes his weapon back. I don't have, a, I don't have a, a rifle. And he starts bandaging up all these guys. So I'm there behind the tree with no rifle. Joe shows up. I said, Joe, give me my rifle. He said, no, get mine. I said, where is it? I don't know. He still won't give me my rifle. 
I said, well, do something, will you? Cover me. He said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm crawling out to get that M60 ammunition and take it to the machine gun over there. They need it. He said, Roy, you blankety blank, 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 like I'm crazy. Low crawl. Get all the M60 ammunition. Run past Joe, past the guys that are wounded. Take it over to the other machine gun. Run back. Low crawl. Get the three M16s that got blown up. Bring those back. Get the rest of the M16 ammunition. Getting all that stuff and come back. Well, Joe said he wanted to be in the foxhole with me. Guess what? He goes and tells the captain, Roy's running all over the place. And he put me in for another bronze star with the V device for Valor. It's just like they may think you're the idiot, but I'm, when it push came to shove, when Red got shot seven times, we're on patrol, and I'm with Bill Williams. He was alive at the time. Bill's alive, and we're on patrol. And Claymore mines went off. But I wasn't walking point at the time. Red was. He was with Big Red 1. And we got had to check out the automatic ambush. What happens? They ambushed us. Red took seven bullets, three in the belly, two in the leg, two in the arm. And the, and the sergeant says, we need somebody to the front. Red's hit, Red's hit, Red's hit. I said, Bill, come on. We got to go to the front. Red's hit. He said, no, no, we can't. They're coming around behind us. We're surrounded. And I said, we ain't surrounded. I'm going to the front. Everybody's got their heads down to the ground. Nobody moved. And I came from the back and ran over everybody and went to the front. And they put me in for another bronze star with the V device for Valor. Mm. That was the second one that I got on that it's little on the, thing. It's on the, it's on the tote there. And it was like after that, the captain sending me to the rear to have the battalion commander pin the bronze stars on me. And then the captain says, come on, let's get him, Larry. And it was just like, that might be the only thing that, you know, out of, the, out of my experiences is that I loved him and he, he loved me. You know about the captain? Yeah, the captain. Yeah. About a month later, after we had built the LZ Ranch, when, we, when they were making a circle, they found that there were sappers. I don't know, I think if that's a proper turn, it's guys that can, were being trained to go through barbed wire. Yeah, NBA or VC who are ba infiltrators, basically. They're infiltrators. Yeah, yeah. And when we went through there, yeah. we saw their training schedule, their training uh, outfit, where they, were, they had all the barbed wire set up and they would go through it. And I mean, just, they were just experts. Well, they hit us 30 days later when it was dark out in the middle of the night. And this is at LZ Ranch. LZ Ranch. Yeah. And that's where it was way, way more casualties than, than the other company shooting on us. Yeah, yeah. Because they came through in dark. Yeah. They didn't set off one trip flare. They didn't set off one Claymore mine. And they had about, I guess, 12 or 15 of them that had came through the barbed wire. And they just, once they get in the middle of you, you can't shoot at them. Because if you're shooting at them, you're going to hit the guy on the other side of your circle. They're in the middle. Which and is one of their tactics, right? That's their tactics. And yeah. they're just throwing grenades in the hooches in our bunker complexes and just killing guys, just throwing things all over. And just the stories that, you know, were there. We ended up killing about 12 of them. And we ended up having about six guys get killed. But in the midst wow. of that, I was on the other side. They came through the woods the closest part of the woods, I was on the other side, and um, one guy got shot through the shoulder, one of our guys, but, you know, that, that was a bad thing, and they just took a bulldozer, dug a hole, threw the 12 dead bodies in, and then buried it back up. But that was, that was bad when, we, when they, we got overrun in Ran LZ Ranch. From their, I mean, they must have known that this was for them a suicide mission. It had to be. Yeah. Well, they had they had 50 caliber machine guns or whatever they had, whatever their caliber was, yeah. on the other side. So they came in this way, and the 50 cal was over here. So I think they were planning on coming in this way and then going out under the cover of the, you know, low crawling out. But they didn't. They I don't. Didn't I don't think any of them made it out. Did, did their machine gun open up on the LZ as well? Yeah, but I mean, it it couldn't have been. They were in the middle. Yeah. So they were probably just picking off the, 
the sides of the circle. Jeez. So w what were you asleep when when this started? Yeah, I think it was about two o'clock in the morning when they hit yeah. us. So someone else was on watch and Yeah. And I mean you're watching, but there's no moon out. They hit you when it's it's overcast and it's you can't see your hand in front of your face and they just yeah. they just went right through the wire just like it wasn't even there. Wow. So what's that like, you know? I mean how long did this whole thing go down? These, well in, these in the morning we just coming in. in the morning it was it was over. You so know, it starts around two AM and And they're just firing here, throwing grenades there and yeah. and you know, it's it's hard to see who's who. You can't yeah. just open up fire. You got to see their face. And one guy played dead. You know, that was a guy that wrote me a letter. I think you read the letter, but it was McBrot. This guy got, he was a machine gunner and he got killed when he was on the berm firing at him. But mm. uh, he said he played dead and, and, you know, he just looked like he was like this. And he had his eye open just, just slightly and he saw the guy. He could see his whiskers. That's how close the, the enemy was. And that guy made it. He just played dead, and he walked by him. He survived this instance, but was killed later. Well, the other or, guy was killed, the machine gunner. He was on the he oh, was on the bunker. Yeah, yeah. He got killed, but he was right near him. Wow. So, so if this thing starts at two a.m., how around what time does everything settle? I'd say it it took a couple hours. Really. Till the last one was was found because it's pitch black. Nobody knows where to fire or what to do. That's probably why six of our guys got killed. The bullets are flying. Yeah. Yeah. And you just, yeah, I mean, that had to be basically a suicide mission. That, yeah, that's what I thought. Get in the middle and just get these Americans and completely disoriented and they and, don't know what they're shooting at. And, and, and you know, yeah. I, I've thought about, I've done, did a lot of thinking over the years, mm. but I'd say in the last two years, my whole mindset has changed. How so? I have the utmost respect for the North Vietnamese mm. and, and their army and the Viet Cong. I mean, you and I are in America. And if somebody invades us, you know, you got your little girl or your boy or whatever, your children. Yeah. You're going to fight for them till the death because they're invading your land. And mm. we were invading their land. Mm. And what would you do if you got your kids at home, you got three or four kids, mm -hmm. and your captain says, okay, I want you to go. And it's, it's basically, if you get out, it's going to be a miracle, but you're going to go. And you know you've got a death penalty mm -hmm. right on your forehead. And you go anyways, and you lay down your life with 12 other guys mm -hmm. just to take out some Americans. Yeah. That is, that's my hero. We weren't like that. You know what we did? Mm -hmm. We went in for one year and got mm -hmm. out. Mm -hmm. And we said, thank God, praise God, we're back in, in America. You know what they yeah, had to yeah. do? They had to do suicide mission after suicide mission after suicide mission. And most of them, I mean, we were fighting teenagers. They were young kids. We'd killed the rest of them. Did and, you see that yourself? I mean, yeah, I saw younger, some, younger kids, you 14, know. 14, 15? Uh, Maybe a little bit 16, older? 16, 17, 18. Yeah. They were young. Yeah. And, uh, you know, there was probably some squad leaders that were probably in their 20s. I mean, all of us, we were 18, 19. I was 19, 20. Yeah. I mean, yeah. one guy, Bill Williams, you know, he he was 28 and we thought he was old. an old man. Yeah. You know, he, yeah. you know. Yeah. I mean, so what you're what you're describing is a sense of um I don't know if admiration or respect just for the incredible tenacity, right, of the NBA, the VC not only I mean, you know, you experienced when you got hit by that friendly fire, you experienced the tremendous power of the American military, right? Yeah. Um, these guys are experiencing that for battle after battle after battle after battle. And then 
And of course, you know, they're fighting the French before. I mean, for some of these folks, it starts in 1945. Yeah. It carries all the way through 1975. Yeah. But that leads to another question that, that comes up, because the NVA and the, and the VC, of course you have some who give up and desert and come to the other side, and you know, the Kit Carsons and all that, but, um, but I mean, the general take is these, these guys were pretty tenacious, and you know, they're losing pretty much every battle, not, not every battle, but they're losing yeah. certainly most battles, <clears throat> but they keep fighting. But then the, the Vietnamese on, on our side, you know, the Arvins, I don't know if you did yeah. much with Arvins oh, yeah. or not. Mountain yard people. Well, there is a sense of respect for them, but, you know, I, well, just, just what, what are your own thoughts about that? Because I'll just put it this way, you know, when vets talk about the VC and the NVA, there usually is that sense of, I mean, they were incredibly tenacious and persevering. The Arvins, not so much. Yeah. You know, the soldiers from South Vietnam. They could flow was, either way. Was that your sense as well? We I never, don't know if you really did anything with the Arvins. We that. never ran into too many uh, Arvins that I know of. Yeah. It was Viet Cong, the NVA, and, you know, we, we saw Chinese in there. I'm, I'm positive there were Chinese that yeah. were in there fighting against us. You yeah. know, that they just come over the border and they're right there. And so you're I've fighting, you're fighting them too. Is that because they were bigger? They just physically just looked. Yeah, different they looked from, different too yeah. than a, than that. Yeah. But I mean, the thing that that kind of got me was, we would get in a firefight. We might kill five or six of them, or something like that, or automatic ambush would hit them. Yeah. And the big deal was, see, I I don't know that I had that much respect, even for a lot of the. Uh, American GIs, mm -hmm. we portray them as heroes, but you know what? I, I, I portrayed a lot of them as knuckleheads. <laughs> they were idiots. The Americans, how can I say I'm an American? When you go yeah. up to a body that's dead mm. and you start shooting yeah. holes in it, mm. just to watch it when it hits the nerves and it just goes, mm. and you start laughing, there's something wrong with that. Okay, yeah. And that's what I saw. And, and, and uh, you know, you chop a Viet Vietnamese's head off and you put it on a stick up there yeah. and you just, and you laugh. Mm. You know, I mean. So that's what you mean by knuckleheads or guys who had just been so brutalized by what they had I, experienced? I think pain. everything that, that we do comes from our heart. Mm. <clears throat> and they're, they were just, didn't care. I mean, I wouldn't do it. You know, yeah. I got I got respect even for a body. You know, you look in the Bible, you got Joseph. He died and they say, take his body and bury it over here. They're respecting the body <clears throat> and not abusing it and just laughing at it. You know, it's just not respect for mankind. Or after we killed, say, four or five, and we go there and, and we'd say, hey, what's he got in his pockets? Let's go see. If he, has he got any knives? Has, and then we pull out the picture of his, and open it up in his wallet, and we just killed Daddy and his four kids. Are we gonna, yay, we just killed Daddy. What if it was you? Yeah. And we killed you, and you got four kids, and you got a widow that's gotta raise those four kids. I look at it differently. It's a whole different thing. They're not the enemy. We're just all human beings that are trying to make it through the day, you know? Is, are you describing, you know, you, you said a few minutes ago that, um, you, uh, that your thinking had changed. So are you describing the way your thought has changed? Or are you, right now, are you describing what you felt at the time? So, for example, you described this guy who, and, and you, you, you read about stuff like this, um, guys in the, fighting the Japanese in the Pacific. They're so, they're so brutalized by what they've been through. They're doing all kinds of horrific stuff. Um, but then others are repulsed by it. So not everybody is brutalized that way. Right. Is that how you felt at that time as well? At that time, did you see that and feel repulsed by it? Or at that time, were you yourself just sort of so numb to it that it kind of... Well, I, I was repulsed by it, yeah. but everything's happening so fast mm. that, you know, it just, it just, you see it and then it's gone. I mean, mm. we had, we had one guy where we had an automatic ambush goes off. This is how crazy I was. 
you got an automatic ambush go off in the middle of the night and you hear people screaming because they lost body parts. When those Claymore mines go off and you got 20 of them in a row and you got somebody that follows a trail and it goes off, yeah. we had about six dead bodies and then we had a couple people that were just really wounded. Yeah. And and one of them was like a one of them was like a girl. Yeah. I mean it, it's just it's and she was a civilian, she wasn't. No, NBA, well she or? was she was an NVA. She was an but, NBA. But or a, a Viet Cong or something. And then you got an then then the captain's there and we put a machine gun right on the trail. And the dead bodies are out there, but there's three people that are still alive. And we got a Kit Carson scout that's speaking Vietnamese and he says, Surrender, we'll get you medical aid. And the guy took his rifle and he started moving it towards our machine gun. And the captain said, get ready, because if he points it any farther towards us, open up on him. So the guy's half dead and he's got his AK-47 and he's turning it towards us. Mm -hmm. And I see the Kit Carson scout talking to this guy. And so the, the captain said, open up. So he opened up for 10 seconds, <laughs> done. And then we walk and we look at him. At one point, he had eyes, nose, cheeks, teeth, ears. He opened up for 10 seconds on his head. He had no head. He had a few pieces of, of uh, hair sticking out the back of his neck and his brains were just slopped on both sides of his head and there's no head. And it's just like you look at that and it's just like you just keep going, whatever. And then we checked out the dead bodies and about three weeks later, we're on patrol and we came back to those same bodies. They're filled with maggots. They stink so bad, you can't eat, it's almost like you gotta throw up just walking by them. But nobody buried them and they're just dead. Yeah. You know? And I mean, this, this experience all by itself, of course, is gonna be, you know, a heavy experience for the rest of a person's life, you know, having that memory. But you're saying that this is just one of many dozens, maybe a couple hundred little moral disasters that you experienced in a year. Yeah, just one after as another. As a 19, 20 year old. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, wow. it's, and, and it's just like every couple of days there's, there's something going on. Yeah. You know, you're, you're you know, it's, it was nuts. So when you, um, when you said your thinking has changed in the past couple of years, then the change is from kind of the, whatever the right word is, the apathy or the numbness, the indifference. It changes from, are you saying it, it changes from a feeling of indifference toward them to a feeling of respect, empathy? Or even how? affection, even yeah. affection. I'd go that far to say affection for them. Because yeah. when I was there, um, my best buddy Bill Williams got killed and I remember the night before he got killed. And, you know, we were up, up on this little kind of ridge or whatever. And we got little care packages, you know, during, from, from the United States. Yeah. And I'd get a, a pudding about once a month maybe. It was just a little can like that and it was about that high. Mm. And I, I ate half of it and, you know, I just couldn't eat any more. It's rich pudding, what are you gonna do, throw it out, you know? Mm. And I said, Bill, here, you can have, have the rest of my pudding. And he said, Larry, why do you treat me so good when I treat you so bad? Mm. And he was just kidding because Bill was the best. If you had too much to carry, Bill was a bull. And he taught high school mathematics in 12, 11th and 12th grade for three years and he got drafted at 28. Wow. And his wife taught at the same school and his sister taught at the same high school. So Bill, we, we're, we went to bed that night and we had an automatic ambush go off. In the middle of the night, boom, it goes off. So you know, we gotta check it out. And that's where we, we lose our guys when we go check out an automatic ambush. Because they're mad, you just blew up five of their buddies and they wanna take you out. And so that went off in the middle of the night and uh, the next day the captain says, all right, you guys got to go out on patrol and see what happened with that automatic ambush. So you don't know if a pig set it off or a chicken or a snake or whatever it might, but normally when we check them off, it was people because we put them where there was a trail. 
Yeah. So that that uh, that day, Bill Williams had six days left in country. Six. He'd been out there for, you know, 300 and whatever days. He had six days left in country, and he's still in the jungle. And Mark ran Statler. Mark had eight days left. And uh, so we had to go on patrol. The guy that has the least amount of time in country doesn't have to go out on patrol. But Mark was saying, man, I don't want to buy it. You buy a bullet, right? Mm. Yeah. And he says, I don't want to buy it. Man, I only got eight days left. You know what Bill said? I'll go. He had six, he said? He had six. Six weeks. Six days left. The guy with the least amount doesn't have to go. Right, right. So Bill said, all right, I'll go. Well, it's at the bottom of the ravine like this. And we got the Claymore mines all lined up, camouflage with the yeah. trip wire there, and yeah. somebody tripped it. So it was, it was a valley. And at the bottom is where it went off. So we have to go down this ridge and get down there. It's only about 40 feet high, 50 feet high. So we're going down there. We get halfway down, and they, had, they ambush us from the top. They're at the top of the ridge, and they're shooting down at us on this side. And how many of you? There are three of you? There's ten. Ten. Okay. Ten of us. Mm -hmm. So we're pinned down. And it's all jungle, so you can't see anything. So we're just putting one magazine after another and just firing up, up where it's coming from. Well, we can't see them. And they can't, they could see us because they're looking down. So we're firing, firing, firing. And then Bill is right next to me, and he goes, ooh, ooh. And I looked over. And he took a bullet right in the head. And he's firing like this. And then he, then he goes, just fell forward. And he goes, Choo! and he pulls the trigger and shoots our other guy. And an M16 bullets tumble, and it just ripped right down his leg. He's screaming. Bill's not saying nothing. And we're calling for the medic. And the captain comes, running. And I, I never saw Bill after that. He, he got, he died. But I never saw it because I'm in the I'm in the battle. And the other guy, the, the medic, shot him full of morphine, and did what they could with Bill. But I'm right there and I'm firing, and the captain comes with about ten guys. So now we got about seventeen guys, eighteen guys, and we get to the bottom there, and they stop firing when he brought more people. Mm. And so you got seventeen guys, and they're checking out the dead bodies again. It was five or six bodies. I wasn't counting. And you know five what or six NVA. NVA yeah. that one that we killed. Yeah. And so you know what the captain says to me? Mm. He said, "Larry, let's go get them." Now there's there's seventeen guys. Why don't we get on an online assault and go get them? But he said, "Larry, let's go get them." And I'm not gung ho. I care less. I want to go home alive. Yeah. I don't care how many I kill. I don't care how many body count there is. I'm not into it. But the people that are gung ho, let's go get them. And I say, well, there's 17 guys here. Why'd you pick me? I mean, you know, we're in Cambodia. Why'd you pick me? Well, I'd been wounded twice already. I had two purple hearts. He's the one that sent me to the rear. I'd do something crazy, run through some bullets or discs. So he sends me back to the rear, and the battalion commander puts a bronze star on me with the Vita device for valor. And then maybe three weeks later, I do something else stupid. And he said, Larry, go back to the rear. So I go back to the rear again. The battalion commander puts another bronze star on me with the Vita device for valor. And so the captain, he, he got to know me a little bit because he kept sending me back for bronze stars. And then I got another one. And then two air medals. Combat mm -hmm. infantry, just all that stuff. Yeah. So he sends me back. So you know what? Who do you think he wants by his side when it's time to go get him? He could have called 17 other guys, but he said, Larry, let's go get him. So what am I going to do? Say, hey, get, find somebody else, man. It's not my turn. <laughs> yeah. You know? So I start mm -hmm. crawling up. I said there was a valley like that. So I start crawling up there. I'm crawling up to get to the top with my M16. Captain's right behind me. Yeah. I mean, come on. You know, the captain, he's running the whole show. We get to the top and see this little cup here? It was like somebody took a whole cup of blood and threw it all over the trees. So when we were firing up there, 
we hit somebody in the face because we blew blood all over the leaves. Mm. And he wants me to follow the blood trail. And somebody on the other end of that with an AK-47, probably half dead, wanting to blow my brains out. And I got a walk point. I'm the point man. So I'm just trying to keep as low as I can. And I, I'm watching. I'm following the blood trail. He's behind me. Everybody else is down in the valley checking out the bodies. It's just him and I. And I start walking and walking, and I get there for a while, and I say to the captain, I said, Cap, I don't see anybody. And I say to people, what do you think the captain said? I told him, I said, I don't see anybody. Yeah, and I think usually people respond, you know, keep looking or something Keep like looking. That. Yeah. Well, you know what? He didn't say anything. I'm the point man. He walked around behind, in front of me, and he took the point. Mm. and he started walking and I'm behind him and he's going to get the first bullet. Wow. And we kept walking for a little bit farther and he said, I think they're gone. And he just started backing up like that. Mm. I respected that man more than anybody I ever met in my life. My dad, my mom, anybody. Because you know what? He was willing to lay down his life and take a bullet for me. If he told me jump, I'd say, how high? You want me to run through bullets? I'll do it for you because you would have done it for me. I respected that man. I've thought about him forever. And when I became a Christian and I understood what Jesus did for me, that he laid down his life for me, for my sins, he shed his blood, I I related it to the captain because he would have done that for me, the same thing Jesus did. And it's just like, that's, that's why I've changed. I mean, it's just yeah. like, I respected that man.